Good evening, everyone. So it is exactly six o'clock. With that, we will be getting started. Um, it's very nice to be back here in Punta Gorda in person. Uh, you know, we, we are uh, the kinds of people who love to travel the, to the communities we work. So I'm very happy that I get to be here in person again. And so I'll, I'll introduce myself for those of you who don't know me. My name is Luisa Leite. I am a project manager and town planner with Dover Coal and Partners. I've been working now in Puno Gorda since 2019. Uh, we worked on the citywide master plan and are now working to update the comprehensive plan and the land development regulations. So we're still in the beginning of this process. Uh, we had started with the comprehensive plan update first and got through the first draft of those updates and took a pause to focus on the land development regulations. And this is really useful um, to actually be preparing both simultaneously um, because we make sure throughout the process that everything is concurrent. You want both your comprehensive plan policies and your zoning and land development regulations to be um, in sync and concurrent with each other. So there will be a second code workshop next Tuesday. Um, and then we'll be working on drafting the first draft of the new form-based code. Um, and then tentatively, we'll do a draft code pinup and public presentation sometime in September. And then uh, we'll be looking to get a, a final draft by December 2021 um, and head to the adoption hearings by February, March. Uh, and so this is a preliminary, sorry, that's 2022, February, March. So this is a preliminary timeline. Things could shift depending, um, but that's, that's the... Overall, these are the milestones we are, are aiming for at this point in the process. So as I mentioned, this is part two and three of a three-phase project that started back in 2019 with the citywide master plan. Um, we then started the, up the comprehensive plan update and have now paused that so we can focus our attention on phase three, which is updating the land development regulation. So now uh, we'll do a quick introduction about land development regulations and form-based code. So uh, land development regulations are the rules that define the rules, procedures, and standards that define the use of land, subdivisions, and development in any city. And there's lots of different things that land development regulations include. One of them, probably the most uh, obvious that most of you are familiar with, are zoning codes and zoning ordinances. And uh, these essentially divide a community into specific districts and specifies different standards that apply to each of those districts. This can also include something like a form-based code, any overlay districts, um, design guidelines, or architectural guidelines, planned unit development ordinances like QDs. But land development regulations also include uh, subdivision regulations, which govern the subdivision of land and also um, the funding and location of public utilities, such as water, sewer, and electricity. And then there's a, several other regulations that fall under this umbrella of land development regulations. This can include impact fees, sign ordinances, uh, floodplain controls, specific landscape ordinances, like stormwater and sedimentation regulations, et cetera. And so some communities have uh, many different sections in their code of ordinances to regulate all these different things. Other communities have what's called a unified land development code, which basically just combines all of these different things into one place. So Puna Gorda um, does not have a unified land development code. It actually does have several different regulations that would fall under the category of land development regulations in a couple of different chapters in its code of ordinances. So it has a code enforcement that's in chapter 9A, has building regulations, that's in chapter seven. Development impact fees is also a separate chapter, chapter 11. Uh, property maintenance and appearance is chapter 16. Subdivisions is chapter 28. And then there is a chapter called land development regulations, which is chapter 26. And this is the one where we'll focus most on, but just so you have an idea that actually there are several different chapters in your code of ordinance that do uh, touch upon how land is subdivided and controlled and can be developed. So why do communities update their land development regulations? There is a, a number of good reasons to do this, um, including to revitalize underutilized or struggling neighborhoods or downtown areas, 
uh, to reflect changing community desires, market realities, and environmental threats. That could include creating more walkable, bikeable, transit-friendly neighborhoods, ensuring high-quality, feasible development, encouraging um, development that will diversify the tax base, preserving historic assets and neighborhoods, encouraging more affordable or diverse housing options, um, improving the enforcement of existing regulations, and conforming with any comprehensive plan changes. So you'll see we've checked about every single one of these as they apply to Puna Gorda. Uh, we didn't check ensuring uh, that the standards reflect changing flood hazards. This is something that Puna Gorda already does and the code already addresses the most up-to-date flooding hazards. But essentially all of these other reasons very much apply to the city of Puna Gorda. And this was evidenced through the citywide master plan process. This is a very good time to be updating the land development regulations. So there's a couple of different types of zoning districts that a city can have. There's a conventional zoning district where the organizing principle is use. So what types of uses are permitted in each zone? And conventional zoning can also include design guidelines or design standards. Um, the organizing principle is still used, but it adds an additional layer of guidance, if you will, to what the types of buildings might look like. So Puna Gorda's zoning is conventional zoning that does have some provisions for architectural standards and design. And then there's a different kind of zoning district, which is a form-based code district. And in this case, the organizing principle is not the type of land use, but rather the building form and place type and the relationship between buildings and their streets. So here's just another graphic that really shows that. In both cases, conventional zoning districts and form-based codes will both deal with uh, code management, and they both address land use um, and form to, to some extent. But form-based codes are much more focused on form and what the building will look like, uh, how it addresses public spaces and streets, um, and how the overall organization of buildings in land in a district is, as opposed to just what can you do inside the building, which would be your land use. So one of the reasons why conventional codes aren't as great in giving you very predictable development is because some of the regulating tools they use aren't actually the best predictors of what a certain project or development will look like. So one example of that is residential density. So all these three images have the exact same residential density, 30 units to the acre, and you can see that depending on um, what the developer wants to do, they can conform with that 30 units per acre and get very different types of development. Now, obviously you will have height restrictions that will limit how tall that tower can be. But even if you just look at the two other examples, uh, you're still getting you know, very different types of development. And this is just an example of that. This is a picture uh, of two streets in Puna Gorda, and they have very similar um, standards, if you will, in terms of density and land use. These are both streets that have a single family residential, roughly four units to the acre, and very similar building heights, and yet the environment is quite different. And that has to do with form, how close the buildings are to the street, um, the design of the street itself, things like landscaping standards as well, um, elements like porches, uh, where garage doors are located. Those are all things that really change the character of the street, even if the land use and density is exactly the same. And so form-based codes get you a lot more predictable development. So a conventional code, like I mentioned, it's gonna give you setback requirements, height requirements, and those setbacks will give you a rough idea of where a building can go on a particular lot. But um, form-based codes use build two lines, which Punaguarda does have maximum setbacks as well as minimum setbacks in some places. That gives you a little bit more predictability about where the building will end up, but it actually goes much further than that. Um, not only does it give you a better idea of where the building will be sited on any lot and where the parking will be located, it can get into very specifics about you know, what are the different elements of a particular facade or architectural elements, roof features, extensions, dormers, balconies, exactly how those, where those can be located along a certain facade or, or primary or secondary street. 
It also gives you a menu of different um, standards for how the building actually meets the sidewalk. So you have what are called frontage types, which could be a gallery or a stoop or a porch, um, and where those types of frontage types are appropriate. Along what streets are those frontages appropriate? So it might be that stoops or galleries or arcades are appropriate along some streets, but they may not be on other streets. So you can get into that level of detail. You also get a menu of permitted building types. So you can decide for your community in a particular form based code district exactly the types of buildings that you want to allow or not. And we're going to get into this in our first exercise. Now, an optional element of form based codes are architectural standards. And these can be as strict or lenient as you as a community want them to be. There are already architectural provisions in the code, but you can get a lot stricter um, about the actual architectural elements that you want to have required in certain places. These are just two examples of that. You can see this example of Florida vernacular on the bottom. That's from Delray Beach. That's from their architectural guidelines, and then as well, Coral Gables, their Mediterranean style guidelines that they use to enforce this. And here you can just see uh, comparing kind of two built results, one on the left, which is built using conventional zoning. This is in Higgins Beach, Massachusetts. And on the right, those are two homes that were built after they implemented a form based code. So even though the materials are very similar, um, the land use again is very similar. You can see how the houses on the right are meeting the street in a very purposeful way. They both are showing porches. They both have doors and windows and places that you would want them to be. Um, whereas on the left, you're getting some odd building forms, um, so very narrow buildings, very tall towers. So this is some of what a form-based code will allow you to control. So just to summarize before we move on, um, form-based codes are, are they're very visual documents that are user-friendly. They're easier to understand because they use diagrams and illustrations. They give you a lot more predictability. Um, they allow for more fine-grained building and place type uh, and zoning. They also define building to street relationships that promote more walkable and vibrant places. They can give you more flexibility of uses and streamline the development process. The only con is that they're a little bit less familiar to administrators, but that is something that throughout this whole process will be worked on. So, introduction to Kunagora's existing land development regulations, and in particular, that we'll be looking at Chapter 26 of the Code of Ordinances. So, just so you have an idea, these are all the different articles in Chapter 26. So everything from the regulating districts to plan development to non-conformities, landscaping standards, signage standards. So there's a whole lot in there to unpack. What we're most interested in for the formic code area and looking at and understanding are of course the regulating districts, um, the permitted uses, both by right and with conditions, plan development, the architectural provisions that I mentioned are already existing. Street standards, uh, parking and loading, sign standards, landscaping, and then the whole uh, approval process. So here is the existing zoning map for the foam based code area. So we're looking at kind of greater downtown area all the way down to Airport Road and uh, all the way eastward or westward to Fisherman's Village. And so the, the primary zoning districts today in this area are at Neighborhood Residential 10, the City Center District, which is your downtown, Special Purpose District, Highly Commercial, Neighborhood Center, and Neighborhood Residential 15. So these are kind of the underlying base zones of the areas we're focused on for the form-based code. So the two main things we're trying to do with the form-based code update is one, to update the development standards and districts. So we want to improve any existing code elements that are hindering the quality, variety, and viability of new development. And the second thing we're trying to do is update the code language, format, and organization. So any existing elements that are making the regulations difficult to understand, implement, and enforce, we want to address. So just a couple examples of those. Um, in terms of things that are potentially hindering quality, variety, and viability of new development, 
there are some existing inconsistencies between the development standards, which could be the lot width, the, the setbacks, the density, um, and what the actual permitted uses and intent or the existing character of that district is today. I'll give you an example. Um, in your land development regulations, the city center zoning district is described to have a broad array of uses in an expected pattern, which integrates restaurants, services, and higher density housing in a compact pedestrian oriented environment. This district is coded to accommodate the higher overall intensity of development to support the city. So while that's the stated intent of the city center district, it actually has the same den maximum density as neighborhood center and neighborhood residential. It doesn't actually, uh, the regulations um, don't necessarily correspond with the stated intent of the district. Another example is uh, in the city center district, the minimum lot width is 16 feet, which is consistent for a row house type building that's narrower. But row houses aren't actually a permitted use in that district. So there's those kinds of small inconsistencies that we're looking to correct through this process. Um, so another example, uh, like I mentioned, there are architectural provisions, but they're fairly weak. And while you have architectural provisions, which is great, there's definitely an opportunity to make them a lot stricter and get um, more desirable development that fits better with the character. Um, example, there's a building type that's called the mixed use building and there's principles for what that building can be but you know they're pretty vague and ambiguous there's a lot of room for improvement uh, when it comes to clearly defining what the different architectural styles are that are permitted um, and you know getting beyond just materials but you know architectural elements that you may want like porches and towers and what those could in terms of how easy the code is to understand, implement, and enforce, uh, there's some things we could definitely do with the form-based code to improve that. A lot of zoning codes have summary tables, for example, that make it really easy to find all the different uses and development standards that apply to each district. It organizes everything into one table. So what you're seeing is an example of that type of table. Um, and this is something that the, the current code doesn't have, which we easily do and we would do with the form based code so that we're making it as easy to find the information that you need as possible. Another example is that there's a lot of provisions that are kind of scattered in many different articles or in some cases in many different chapters of your code of ordinances. Uh, for example, regulations about uh, permitted uses and structures in water bodies. There's a lot of different regulations related to that that are in a number of different places. Uh, but from chapter six, which is about vessels, docks, and waterways, to chapter 26, article three, which is the Marine Park District. There's other regulations that fall under the Waterfront Overlay District, which is in a different article. Um, and there's also standards for liverboards, houseboats, and other watercraft that's also in a different article. So those, that's also an opportunity to make sure we're putting everything um, that's related to a particular topic in one easy to find location. So right now there are certain building types that are either flat out prohibited or restricted by setback um, or lot width. And examples of those are mixed use buildings are very much restricted by certain provisions in the existing code, as well as uh, row houses and cottage courts, bungalow courts, and single story shop fronts. These are all things that are currently restricted in. So the first exercises is what building types are appropriate and where. So we'll be showing a couple of different areas in this form-based code area, as well as different types of buildings. And we're gonna be asking you a couple of questions about that. So here are the areas. This is the form-based code area, and we have divided it into some discrete areas. And this isn't supposed to be a, a, a zoning district that we've already drawn. It's just to help us get through the exercise. So we've identified kind of the core of your commercial downtown, um, as well as the East Downtown Medical District along Marion and Olympia, all the way to the hospital. Uh, area C is the area just around Fisherman's Village. Area D is the US 41 Highway Commercial Corridor. And E is the historic residential that's west of 41. F is the historic residential east of 41. 
And then G is the traditional residential that you have on either side of the US 41 commercial corridor. So I'm going to run through a number of different building types. And these are all building types that are uh, fairly restricted right now through the code. One of those is compact single family. So compact single family homes, this is still a detached single family home. It's just usually on a smaller lot and it might be a little closer to its neighbor, closer to the street. These are just two examples, one from South Carolina, one from Key West. There's also estate or large single family homes. And this is something you see if people come, they can uh, buy up a couple lots, aggregate them and build one very, very large home on it. You can see in certain places. Another building type is a cottage or a bungalow fort. And so this has small detached single family homes that are organized around some common green space or court in the middle. This is a, a type of development that we're seeing becoming increasingly popular. Um, if people you know, want to live more in a community that still have their own single family home, it's usually smaller homes that are, are close together. We have triplex and fourplexes. These are units that look a lot of times like they're single family homes, but can have uh, three or four units inside of them. These are actually local examples of those. A row house or townhouse. So these are not permitted right now anywhere in Punta Gorda. And these are attached single family homes, so they share walls. We have multiplexes, which have anywhere from five to 12 units in them. The image on the, on the left is an existing example here in Punta Gorda. And the image on the right is uh, from a town in California. We have garden and courtyard apartments. Uh, so these are smaller apartments. Uh, they have their residential ground floors and they're not mixed use buildings. And they're organized around, again, some kind of garden or court or courtyard. There's live work buildings. And these a lot of times might look like a row house or townhouse, but the ground floor is non-residential. So it could be an office, it could be a shop front. And then there's usually one single living unit above it. This is actually the, on the right is the Swiss Connections building here in Santa Borda. That's an example. The one example here locally you have of a, a live work type building. Then there's a small footprint mixed use. This is where you have a ground floor that's commercial or non-residential, and then some residential or office on the upper floors. And we're calling this the small footprint, so it's not a block-sized mixed-use development, but it's kind of a single infill lot that is a mixed-use building. And then there's a medium footprint mixed-use, which would be something like the Sunloft building. So that's a, a larger version of the previous one that I showed you. And this one might take up half a block or a full block. So again, these are just some building types and I'll show the last one would be a traditional main street building type. So again, here on the right, this is here in Punta Gorda along Marion. And on the left, that's a, a picture of uh, downtown Richard Park. So as I mentioned, we'll be sending out a survey that has this exercise on it. And uh, we encourage all of you to take it. We'll be emailing that, it'll also be on the website. So now we'll go to our final part of the meeting, which is our second exercise, interactive exercise. So as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, this is the existing zoning map of Puno Gorda in this form based code area that we are studying specifically. And you can see that um, there are large portions of this area that are painted in the same color. So for example, uh, you have both Marion and Olympia in that East Downtown Medical District area are all uh, are both neighborhood commercial NC zoning districts. So if you actually look at the development and the character of those, those streets in that area, they can be quite different. So on the left, you have a picture of East Marion and you have a picture of East Virginia. And while the north side of East Virginia is neighborhood center, which is the same as the zoning along Marion and Olympia on the south side that's actually NR15. Um, and one of the great things about form based codes is you can be a lot more fine grained in the land development regulations and the development standards along specific streets. 
So uh, in the form-based code, we could say that even though the permitted uses may be similar, we want special rules to apply, say, along Marion and Olympia that wouldn't necessarily apply or be appropriate along Virginia, for example. And we do that through a regulating plan. So a regulating plan looks a little bit different from a zoning district. Um, it's just more fine-grained. You can get into more detail about the actual standards and the zoning district that applies along specific streets. And here you can see an example of that. You'll see along certain corridors that both sides of that street have a darker color applied to it. And that's kind of a best practice. In general, when you're developing a new code, you want to ensure as much as possible that you have light facing light. So if certain rules apply on one side of the street, you should probably apply to the other side of the street. And that creates a more cohesive environment. So that's one thing to keep in mind. That, which isn't always the case. As I mentioned on Virginia, you have one set of rules for one side of the street and a different set of rules for the other side of the street. So our second exercise is going to be about a uh, hierarchy of development intensity. So we're not setting specific rules about what high intensity or low intensity is exactly at this point. We're just trying to get an idea of, of what the hierarchy of intensity and development may be along certain streets. This is a kind of a first step when you're writing a code or updating a code. Is you want to understand what should be allowed on certain streets and what shouldn't be allowed on others. So we took it a stab at this. And we created this preliminary keyword being preliminary map of what the hierarchy of development intensity might be in the form based code area. So in the red, that's what we've identified for the highest intensity of development, which is mostly focused in on the downtown core. Then there in orange, you have medium intensity. In yellow, you have lower intensity. And then any unmarked street is, is the lowest, absolute lowest intensity. We haven't given a color. Now I know you're wondering what is what is high intensity, what is medium intensity. So to kind of help you think about it, we created this diagram. So at the lowest end of the scale, you would have your single-family homes and maybe your duplexes as well, but buildings in scale and general scale and size similar to a single-family home. Then at the lower intensity, which is that yellow color. You could have your one to two story um, commercial or main street buildings, but you could also have your two story multiplexes, but still smaller scale buildings. In medium, you start to get your two to three plus story buildings, a little bit larger, something similar to some commercial office buildings or to some of the buildings in Fisherman's Village today. And then at the very highest intensity, you have the types of buildings like the Sunlofts or the Wyvern Hotel, just to give you a sense of this, the spectrum that we're thinking about. And now we're gonna do a, a, a quick test of this exercise. Like with the building type exercise, there will be a much more detailed version of this on the website, which we will link to you all. If you're really interested in looking at every single street we've identified and letting us know if you agree or not, or what you would change about the map as we've drawn it, but at least to do a test run, we're going to zoom into one area and kind of look at the different um, intensities that we've mapped. So here we've zoomed in specifically into the downtown core. And you can see that we've identified some streets in red at highest intensity, some for medium intensity, some for lower intensity in yellow. And then there's some we haven't marked at all. And those would be the, the absolute lowest intensity. So we're a little bit over. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Like I mentioned, we'll be putting a report together of all the Q&A questions, including those that people on Zoom um, asked, and those our panelists online have been answering those throughout the meeting. And so you, you can get a full report of that in the next couple of days, along with uh, links to the video, to the two exercises. If you wanna do those in more detail, like I mentioned, you'll be able to do that online. So thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it.